Have you ever listened about the Blackbeard's treasure? Octopuses are currently inhabiting the ship that is thought to have been Blackbeard's flagship. When maritime archaeologists approach the ship, the octopuses turn a pale green color, indicating that they are upset. Moray eels and black sea base nibble at the excavator's ears, and guns, many of which are still loaded with ammunition, spew moray eels and black sea base out of their mouths. However, after nearly three centuries of resting in the shallow waters of North Carolina, the wreckage of a ship that may have been the Queen Anne's Revenge is beginning to surface, plank by worm-eaten plank. The location, which was found in 1996, is less than a mile and a half from the coast and is submerged to a depth of 25 feet. However, lengthy weather delays between diving seasons and uncertain funding have hindered the excavation. This past fall's trip was the first one since 2008, and it can take years to clean and evaluate objects that are so corroded that they are unrecognizable. Archaeologists are growing more sure that the wreck is the historic frigate that plagued the Caribbean and once blockaded Charleston, South Carolina, for a week before running aground in June 1718. Objects have been retrieved from 50% of the site, and this has increased the archaeologists' confidence in their theory. Mike Daniel, the ship's captain who was responsible for the first discovery of the vessel, was the one who taught me, Welsh. Daniel is a successful treasure hunter who, in 1972, assisted in the discovery of Nuestra Sonora de las Maravillas, a Spanish galleon that was carrying gold and gems when it fell off the coast of the Bahamas in the year 1656. However, it was Welsh who most effectively conjured up the image of a pirate by donning skull and crossbones earrings as well as a pendant in the shape of a galleon around her neck. She tore through the laboratory, ripping the tarpaulin off of the cannons with such fervor that Blackbeard may have invited her on board. The badly corroded cannons, which measured approximately 8 feet in length and were designed to fire cannonballs weighing 6 pounds each, were being restored by bathing them in a variety of chemical baths for approximately 5 years. Cannons that had not been subjected to any kind of chemical treatment were difficult to recognize in some cases. Sand, seashells, and other things will attach themselves to the sides of a corroding metal artifact while it is submerged in water. These objects will then serve as attachment points for marine life, such as barnacles. The term concretions refers to these outer layers, which become more substantial as time passes. X-rays are used by the personnel in the laboratory to investigate the objects to see what is underneath them. Nevertheless, some things cannot be seen. If the specialists cleaning the concretions with air scribes, a form of mini jackhammer, are not careful, valuable pieces may be damaged or destroyed. This is especially true for the smaller pieces. Once you touch a glass bead, it shatters, and you're done, says Welsh. There's no going back. No wealth has been discovered on board the ship that was most likely captained by Edward Teach, also known as Blackbeard. The only thing that has been discovered so far is a very small amount of gold dust, which is less than an ounce. According to depositions taken in the 18th century, Blackbeard, who was given his moniker for his remarkable facial hair, which he wore in braids, captured his best and greatest warship from French slave traders in 1717, 100 miles off the coast of Martinique. The warship could carry around 300 tons, was armed with 16 cannons, and was transporting hundreds of slaves in addition to 20 pounds of gold dust. Blackbeard, who had served the crown in Queen Anne's War against France, 1702, 13, before going into business for himself, renamed his prize in honor of the English monarch as soon as he got his hands on it, even though it was already called La Concorde. After releasing the majority of the slaves and the captive crew, as well as taking their gold, Blackbeard spent several months plundering around the Caribbean, during which time he acquired a miniature navy consisting of smaller boats and amassed a large crew. The specifics of how the ship grounded itself are still up for debate at this point. Some industry professionals think that Blackbeard was just another victim of the perilous sandbanks that can be found near the opening of the Beaufort Inlet. These sandbanks tend to move during storms, which can confuse even the most experienced current captains. Others, on the other hand, believe that Blackbeard intentionally abandoned the ship because it was far too large to navigate the shallow sounds of North Carolina to decrease his crew, some of whom later claim that Blackbeard did this, and travel light moving his riches to the smaller ships that were part of his fleet. 
In any case, the sinking of the Queen Anne's Revenge was what archaeologists refer to as a non-violent wreck event, which means that the pirates had plenty of time to unload their loot before the ship went down. To our good fortune, archaeologists have a unique conception of what constitutes a treasure. They have discovered hundreds of historical artifacts, some of which include a miniature signal cannon, turtle bones, possibly relics of a favorite pirate diet, a pewter syringe, a funnel, shaped spout that acted as a urinal, and an undamaged piece of window glass that is blue-green and rippling like a sculpture of the sea. An intricate sword hilt constructed of iron, copper and the horn or antler of an animal was recovered in the dive that took place in 2010. The problem is that none of these can definitively confirm the identification of the ship. Even while the datable artifacts can be traced back to the decades before the vessel sank, any dates after June 1718 would be powerful proof against the ship's claim to renown, there is as of yet no evidence that supports the ship's claim to fame. To begin, there is the overall position of the wreck, which, when compared to the historical narratives and old maps that Daniel employed in his quest, comes out on top as the most accurate. According to him, in the world of shipwrecks, our fundamental philosophy is that it is where it's supposed to be, and he argues that this is exactly what we believe. This is the sandbar, this is the channel coming in, and here in this channel is where the QAR is located. Then there is the enormous size of the three-masted ship, which would have made it an extraordinary, if not one of a kind, visitor to the Beaufort Inlet, which is not very frequently traveled. Although the La Concorde only had a total of 16 cannons on board, the pirates very certainly would have added more of their cannons to their arsenal. Archaeologists have found over 225,000 pieces of lead shot and identified at least 25 cannons. It appears that firearms were always maintained with ammunition, which is a common habit among criminals. And then there's the cargo that they had on board in the first place. At least one of them had iron bolts lodged inside its barrel and other clues point to deck-clearing munitions being used, such as the remnants of canvas sacks filled with broken glass, nails, and other types of shrapnel. Jim Craig, who is serving as the project's head geologist, is quoted as saying, a proper Englishman would not do that. However, a pirate is a pirate, and as such, he does whatever he pleases. Because wood that is exposed to seawater rots away, there is not a great deal of timber remaining to investigate. To our good fortune, some of the ships continued to be buried in the sand. The group discovered two draft marks when they salvaged a piece of the stern that weighed 3,000 pounds. These marks were designed to indicate how much of the ship was submerged in the water. Even though such measurements were essential to navigation, the ones on this ship appear to be oddly wrong. There is a difference of 12.75 inches as opposed to the usual foot between the markers. More, however, realized that the French measurement for a foot at that time was precisely 12.75 inches. In the meantime, archaeologists can't wait to get started on the excavation of the largest concretion of them all, which is a massive heap of cannons and anchors that are still lying on the seafloor. They are keeping their fingers crossed that the mound is large enough to include material that can be maintained for micro, organic study. This is the end of today's video. Give your precious feedback in our comment section below. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos.